Good morning, everybody. It's great to be back at EU amongst old friends. I recognize so many of you from last year. Appreciate your attendance. Um, I'd like to talk about some what we consider incontrovertible evidence that the skies are radically different nowadays than they were in prehistoric times. Okay, the top scholar of Mesoamerica had this to say, the peoples of ancient Mesoamerica keenly observed the sky and used the calendar to predict solar and lunar eclipses, the cycles of the planet Venus, the apparent movements of constellations and other celestial events. To them, these occurrences were not the mechanical movements of innate celestial bodies, but constituted the activities of the gods the actual recapitulation of mythical events from the time of creation. You could take that statement and apply it exactly to the traditions of ancient Egypt, ancient Mesopotamia, ancient India, Greece, the rest of the world. That is what myth is all about, describing the behavior of the gods in the sky as creation unfolded. So in the Maya account of creation, here's what it says. They fixed their eyes on the dawn, looking steadfastly for the coming forth of the sun. They occupied themselves in looking for the great star, which appears first before the birth of the sun. The face of this green morning star always appears at the coming forth of the sun. So the takeaway lines here are that the morning star appeared at creation, and that it was green in color. Those astronomers among us will know that Venus does not currently present a green color. The Maya uh, had a hieroglyphic script, and um, so in their earliest writing systems, this was their glyph that denoted the great star. So this is the great star they're talking about, the morning star. And I would draw your attention to the glyph on the right, which looks like a little star cross in the middle on like a fourfold form. But look at the four little circles in the four corners. Kind of keep that in mind as we go forward. These are two more variations upon the same glyph that are in hundreds and hundreds of Mayan hieroglyphic codices. So they're both the same sign, it's just the one on the left shows a, a star in the middle of the four dots, and the one on the right, it looks more like a cross. So the question is, or I guess it's pretty obvious that that sign is not recognizable in today's sky. So consequently, the top scholars in Mesoamerican studies say this is an abstract image. What does it show? Well, according to them, it shows the four different phases of the planet Venus, all of which are invisible, needless to say. So here's the, here's the top scholar in a recent book. says, the fact that there are four circles in a cross-shaped frame naturally suggests the four phases of Venus associated with the four different directions. So clearly the assumption is that this is an abstract drawing that some astronomer dreamed up a long time ago. As it turns out, that image is present at least 500 B.C., so they are essentially telling us that the Mayans were practicing super sophisticated astronomy in 500 BC already. Unfortunately, most of those guys have no knowledge of comparative art or comparative mythology, so they kind of overlook the fact that the exact same sign is found all around the world. So here's the exact same image from an old Babylonian cylinder seal from roughly 2000 BC. So that right there just shoots their theory out of the water um, that that's an abstract sign. 
Here's a very similar image from the pre-Vedic civilization in ancient India. This is roughly 3000 BC. So you can see that this image is prehistoric in nature. Okay, back to ancient Mesoamerica. This is a, another very common sign for the great star. And again, it will be found in various different cultures down there, whether you're talking the Mayas, uh, the Aztecs. Um, I guess I should maybe point out which sign I'm even talking about there. But I'm talking about, the, whoops. Sorry about that. Kind of jumped on us. this stellar form here to the left, you will see is a, is a uh, fourfold star. And so that is the image that they're talking about, the ancient Mayans, when they're talking about the great star. And this particular image can actually be found on a colossal face down in uh, Olmec times, which is 1000 BC in Mesoamerica. And these massive faces were found, uh, not unlike the Easter Island statues. They're about 10 tons in size. I mean, they're just a massive piece of rock. And on the side of the rock, it will have that exact sign. It's already at 1000 BC. This is a much more recent example of the same sign uh, from the Pueblo region here in the American Southwest. And an astronomer offered the following discussion of this sign. He says, this is a common form of the southwestern four-pointed great star symbol and the sun in the center. So think about that for a second. It's not totally obvious, but if you focus your eyes, you'll see that there's a red object there in the middle of the fourfold star. And this astronomer is calling that the sun. That's his explanation. The only problem with that explanation is the sun, of course, can never appear inside a star in today's sky. So that, that might be your first hint that that's not going to go very far. And again, they've overlooked the fact that that exact same image is going to be found all around the world. So here's another clearer example of the same size, the same sign from the American Southwest. This is from a prehistoric petroglyph here in, in North America, showing the same sign. Again, I would kind of direct your attention to the dark orb in the middle and what looks like a little ring around it. Now if we go to ancient Babylon again, we see virtually the exact same image. The fourfold star, the circular orb in the middle, only this time it's set within a crescent. And those, those of you that are familiar with uh, Dave's argument on the polar configuration, you have planets in a polar configuration set within a crescent. This is a, an example of the same sign from 4000 BC in prehistoric Egypt, the exact same image, just a little bit different coloration. Okay, this is an object called the quincross, and it's ubiquitous in Mesoamerica. You can find it everywhere. It's one of the top symbols. And... Um, you can see if you look carefully, it's just kind of cut off the points. So it's the exact same sign as we've been looking at with the so-called sun in the middle and the four-pointed star. Again, scholars recognize that in the Mayan language, this quincross always designates the turquoise color or green. Everyone accepts that.
the Arapaho used to live up in Canada, went down to Mexico, or went down to Minnesota, and uh, over to the they currently are in Wyoming, but they on virtually all their teepees, they would always have that fourfold star, and they would always call it the morning star, the exact same symbol. And so here's a, here's a scholar on that particular object. The morning star appears in the shape of a Maltese cross, a diamond, and a traditional cross. So again, we're going to find that all around the globe. The question is, why would anyone describe or represent the morning star with those shapes that aren't present in today's sky. A different scholar also talking about the Arapaho. Like the morning star, this cross-like form, it is painted green, and she's talking about the teepees now, um, that the morning star sign is traditionally painted green. different scholar talking about the designs found in Arapaho uh, weaving uh, and dress forms. And he says, in all contexts, the cross refers to the morning star. The cross is associated with dawn, youth, and the beginnings of motion, and the convergence of roads. So think about that for a second as you look out into the sky tonight and look at the morning star. Would the idea of youth or the convergence of roads ever occur to anyone? And yet we're going to find that that's, those are very widespread ideas and themes associated with the morning star. So back to the original Maya sign we were looking at. If these signs are looked at as actually representing a form in the sky rather than an abstract image according to the top scholars, you can readily see how you might see four roads in the fourfold star, especially on the form on the right where you have a cross actually represented. Now we move to a familiar image from ancient Babylon. Again, the, the cylinder seal. You couldn't get a better illustration of four roads if you wanted. Again, it's set within the crescent exactly like the fourfold star that we've been talking about. This is an image Dave and I have been talking about for 30 years. The image leaves little doubt there's something up there, something different than anything we see today. So actually, in, uh, in that groundbreaking book that we all have come to love and know, The Saturn Myth, here's what Dave said, 1980, for every dominant mythical theme, there are corresponding signs, though the truth is yet to be acknowledged by most authorities. That should probably read by all authorities. The signs of the four roads are the sun cross and the enclosed sun cross. Back to a different Mayan account of creation. This describes the original appearance of Quetzalcoatl in the sky, and as everybody knows, or most people accept, Quetzalcoatl was identified with the morning star. And basically, the story is he set himself on fire, not unlike the Greek Hercules on a great funeral pyre. And when the ashes were extinguished, then arose his heart, the Quetzal bird itself. They saw it, and so they knew that he had entered the sky. The old ones used to say that he was transformed into the dawn star, the morning star. The takeaway here is that the Quetzal star is the most beautiful star in all of Mesoamerica, and it's famous for its wildly green turquoise plumage. And it was, it was so prized that it was prized more than gold by the ancient Mayans, um, the feathers especially. And, and the, the word for that bird came to be um, used instead of precious. So it was like the most preci precious uh, 
substance they had, and they, they traded it amongst all the tribes. We turn to ancient Egypt where we find the creation account in the pyramid text, and here's what it says about the morning star there. O morning star, Horus of the netherworld, divine falcon. And then the next term, the W3D, 3D bird, whom the sky bore. The word W3D means to make green or to rejuvenate. And so the scholar Ronald Clark, in translating this passage, he he, you know, Faulkner in this particular reading, he left the word untranslated, but Clark translates it literally as the green, green bird whom the sky bore. So you have this exact correspondence between the oldest Maya account of creation where Quetzalcoatl, the morning star, appears as this brilliant green bird. Now you go back to 2500 B.C., and on the pyramid walls, you have a description of Horus as the morning star ascending to heaven as a, a brilliantly colored green star or green bird. Back to a different now, later Mayan account of creation. At this particular mountain, when it dawned, dawn is the Mayan word for creation, or the first time, when it dawned, they were kneeling, they were occupied, shouting when the great star came out. The great star, of course, is their term for the morning star. This, for those biblical experts out there, this kind of reminds us of the old passage from Job that reads, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And as biblical scholars have shown, those two lines from that biblical passage, those are in opposition. So it, it means they're describing the same, the same thing. So the morning stars are the sons of God. The morning stars there are shouting for joy. Turning to uh, an Egyptian account of creation now, one of my favorite accounts totally overlooked, I've never seen it discussed by any other scholar, describes again Horus the morning star, when thou risest in the horizon of heaven, a shout of joy to thee from the mouth of all peoples, beautiful one, becoming young at thy time, in or as the disc within the hand of thy mother Hathor, thou risest in the horizon of heaven, thou sheddest upon the two lands, green light, turquoise light, the boy mighty. This is the translation from um, uh, Budge's Egyptian, pyramid, uh, Egyptian Book of the Dead, sorry. And the takeaway words there are the word for becoming young, which is RNP, one of the most important recurring uh, words in the Egyptian language for the time of creation. Uh, and the second word is the MFK3T word down there, and that is the word for turquoise. So the morning star Horus shines a brilliant turquoise, but he appears as a youth, the boy, H-W-N. As we see, that's the, one of the standard Egyptian terms for a youth. So here are those, here are the top two terms again. Basically, what's being described is when Hor Horus, as the morning star, is shining a brilliant green in the creation skies, he's being described as being, one, super beautiful, two, young, three, rejuvenated. So the leading Egyptian word for be young, rejuvenated, is RNP. The second word, HWN, is, describes Horus as a youth, but it also carries the connotation that he was rejuvenated. The third word is the Mayan word that in the first slide was translated the green morning star. The, so the word Roxa was translated by that scholar as the green morning star, but it also means the rejuvenated one. 
again, a one-to-one -one correspondence between the most ancient traditions of Mesoamerica and the ancient traditions of Egypt. So let's take a closer look at that Egyptian word HWN. This is the sign in question that uh, is the hieroglyph describing that word. And it shows a fourfold flower. So this is taken from a, a leading Egyptian dictionary. So at the bottom you see that their uh, rendering of the definition of that word is flower from the phonetic value WN. And so, so far as I know, no Egyptologist has ever questioned the fact that this sign describes a flower. There's never at any point, so far as I know, a discussion that it actually describes a star. So we've got the same problem we had when we started in Mesoamerica. Um, is this a flower or is this a star originally? It's clearly described as both. Now direct your attention, this is some of the earliest rock art from ancient Ireland. And in the middle, see if I can do this without screwing this screen up. It's not wanting to let me pop up. But anyway, you can see that fourfold flower in the middle. Curiously, the old flower is set in what looks like a bunch of celestial objects on the face of that rock. And so the assumption that we would draw is it's not a flower at all. It's a star that happens to look like a fourfold flower. And again, Dave and I have discussed these particular petroglyphs ad nauseum for 30 years. This, this just happens to be one of my favorite uh, petroglyphic sites, not only because it's so old, but it's still well preserved. And so you can see the ladder to heaven there, and you can see the enclosed sun, you can see crescents. Uh, but you get this sprouting flower-like form um, you know, and, and most, most rock art ex experts will call those sunbursts, or they, they certainly will acknowledge that those are stellar forms. There's no question that these aren't a bunch of uh, sunflowers that are being painted. This is a super old cylinder seal from Mesopotamia, basically showing a very similar fourfold flower. Uh, and interestingly, if you look at the, well, first off, you see the fourfold flower in the middle. There's four other flowers around it. But look at the one in the middle. You'll see that it has those four little dots around it again, kind of like the Mayan image that we started with. This is another very early Mesopotamian cylinder seal, probably about 3000 BC. Same image, basically. Now here's the virtually the same image, again set within that crescent, just like the fourfold flower, just like the fourfold star, just like the cross. This is more like 2000 BC. It's a little bit later, but you can see that it preserves the same sort of idea. It looks like it looks like a four-petaled flower, but clearly it's a star. Back to Egypt. This is a, a very early design of that sign we were talking about, the HWN or WN sign. And you'll see that it not only looks like a, a fourfold flower again, that's why the Egyptian experts say that it represents a flower, but look at those four dots. You're, again, these four dots just kind of appear everywhere, not always, because they didn't always remember to include it, but it appears all around the, the globe, enough that you can bet your life that those four dots were originally present. And so many, as I look out over the crowd earlier, I saw that so many of you are wearing the 
plasma discharge shirt from the EU conference. And if you will remember, the little squatter man uh, image on the back of the shirt made famous by Tony Peratt, it always has those two little circles, or often I should say, kind of like this image. It doesn't always include the two dots, but it includes it enough that you know that it was originally there. So those two dots are structurally analogous to these four dots. They're probably describing a, a diacroton instability in this plasma discharge. And um, it's just a cry and shame. Tony's not here to, to tell us exa the exact physics behind this. But um, I can tell you that when we, I think we met with him in <clears throat> roughly 2000, 2001, uh, Dave and I had a week-long meeting with, here uh, in Phoenix with um, Tony where we tried to write up his initial article that was just a, an absolute groundbreaking article on uh, the presence of uh, discharge, plasma discharge phenomena in ancient rock art. And, and as you know, or many of you know, Tony traveled all around the world with my buddy Renz Vandersloosh taking pictures of all these petroglyphs and he, he published this absolute masterpiece of an article in a very obscure place, roughly 30 pages with hundreds and hundreds of images, showing beyond any shadow of a doubt that some of these ancient rock art images actually represent plasma discharge phenomena in the sky. And so uh, when I was discussing uh, at, at, in Phoenix here with Tony, he uh, about 30 years ago, I had written an article on this quincunx structure, which we're going to get to in a second, but it's essentially this structure. It's a fourfold structure with these four dots. And uh, Tony said, that's one of the most common signs that I get in my laboratory, which complete shock to me. I I'd never heard something like that before. But he also said this would be fully expected if you had planets in a conjunction like Dave and I have hypothesized about. So just to keep in your mind or your mind's eye that we've moved now from the Egyptian image back to the Mayan image just to keep it uh, so that we see that it's not only a fourfold star but a cross-like form with the four dots. Back to the Egyptian form but the thing to take away is that in the Egyptian hieroglyphic script, that fourfold flower is often substituted by just a, a plain cross. So clearly the Egyptians recognized that this fourfold flower like form was also a cross. Back to the Mayan civilization. One of my favorite scholars just wrote a, an entire article on this subject, but she said the quatrefoil, a four-lobed flower-shaped symbol, is ubiquitous in Mesoamerican iconography and traces its roots back to the pre-classic period, roughly 1000 BC. So this is the earliest image of that that I know of. Uh, this is from the Olmec times again, kind of like that colossal head image we were talking about earlier, but it's the one in the middle, and it, um, you know, it's set a little bit askew, so you have to kind of turn your head to see the exact same fourfold star that we've been talking about. And lo and behold, that particular image is the leading image in the Mayan language for the word sun. And it's, you know, the word in question is kin or a variation upon that word in the different Mayan languages. So, you know, all the top Mayan scholars will readily admit that the Mayans represented the sun as a flower-like form. Here I would call your attention to the fact, though, that that flower-like form is set right in the middle of those of a cross-like structure or the four directions we were talking about earlier. We were asking how is it possible that the morning star could possibly be associated with four directions. It's pretty obvious from this image why that might be the case. 
So in one of the sacred books of the Maya that was luckily preserved, one of the few books, um, here's what it reads. Fourfold was the plate of the flower, and the sun god was set in the center. If you didn't know better, they're describing that same symbol that we showed earlier from Southwest America, that where the astronomer said the sun is set in the middle of the fourfold star. Incongruously, I might add. So here is the standard Mayan glyph for flower, and you can see the resemblance to the previous example where they employed the glyph for flower to write the word for sun. But you can see that this is a quincunx structure again where you have something in the middle and then four objects emanating outwards. Again, top scholar in the world as far as I'm concerned. For the Aztecs, the quincunx represented turquoise. In surveying the various surviving elements of indigenous thought in Mesoamerica, the quincunx stands out as one of the most important aspects of the Mayan mindset. It's everywhere. It's at the center of all their thinking, all their religious rituals. Throughout the development of Mesoamerican civilization, the pervasive tendency to dramatize creation by constructing on earth a reduced version of the cosmos or a copycat version, usually in the form of their state capital, gave Mayan cities the sacred form of the quincunx. So it always has something in the middle, four roads emanating out from the center. This is a, a book that's just came out in the last six months. It's a fantastic book. It's called Make Maya Sacred, Sacred uh, Geography. And she just states bluntly that a key is, a key to the imagery, that four roads radiated out to the four directions. Back to the Maya slide, that, or the uh, sun glyph that we talked about earlier to just show the four radiating forms from the center. Just a quick review of the Mesopotamian image where there can be no question that these four radiating forms emanated from the center of a sun-like object corresponding to nothing in today's sky. One of my favorite prayers from ancient Mesopotamia. This, this was one of the earliest written documents. It's the Sumerian temple hymns. And it just says, the four corners of heaven became green for Enlil like a garden. Just think about that, looking up in the sky and, and seeing four corners of heaven becoming green. I mean, well, obviously there's nothing like that in the sky today. This is the form that Dave has reconstructed about this particular story, this particular episode in creation. And so you have Mars set in the middle, the red orb there. Behind Mars, mostly obscured, is the planet Venus. And the interaction of those two bodies uh, causes this green filament material to stream across the sky. And so in the sacred traditions of every ancient culture around the world, you will find these four streamers remembered as the four rivers of creation, the four winds of creation, the four roads. The image is everywhere. Again, it corresponds to nothing in the current skies, but it corresponds to the stellar symbols uh, preserved by indigenous peoples on all the continents. This, these are quotes from my favorite Egyptian scholar talking about uh, the pyramid and coffin texts. And he's the only guy that I know of 
that has noted that the sun is described as green, the sun's rays are described as green, but he doesn't even attempt to um, explain why that might be the case. So the first sentence reads, turquoise is the substance from which the sun is composed. What the heck does that mean? The next one says, in countless pieces of evidence, the word turquoise describes the sun in the early morning or the sun at creation. The last quote is straight from the Book of the Dead describing uh, the rays of Horus. Thy rays are of turquoise. Back to the Aztecs now, on the other, other side of the ocean, this is an early Aztec prayer. Now thou causest the sun to appear, to come forth. Now once again thou art rejuvenated, thou emergest as a child. Once again thou becomest a baby, thou becomest a precious green stone, a precious turquoise. Once again newly thou dost sprout. So just look at those images that they're using there. They're describing the sun as green, precious green stone. It's sprouting like a flower. It's described as a youth or a child, and it's rejuvenated. The exact same images that the Egyptians described Horus ascending to heaven as. And so those of you that were here last year, you will remember that the subject of my talk was the sacred marriage between the planet Venus and the planet Mars. And the cornerstone of that marriage is that Mars uh, impregnates Venus, uh, and as a result, the entire world experiences a dramatic greening or a flowering. Fertility is brought to the entire world. That's what the skit skiddy Pawnee of North America here. That's what their uh, story represents. So I'll, I'll just read you the, one of the leading Pawnee scholars. Quote, in the creation story, fruitfulness and light came into the world because Morning Star, and clearly Morning Star is described as the planet Mars, and his realm of light had conquered and mated with Evening Star in a realm of darkness. And this is just my own summary of last year's speech. But the morning star married the evening star. The morning star is, is certainly described as the planet Mars. And it's also described as the great star. Those, those were the, wor the Pawnee words for morning star mean great star, the exact same word that, or the exact same um, phrase used by the Mayans to describe that star earlier. Now they're talking about the planet Venus. She was a beautiful woman. Through this star and morning star, all things were created. Through her, it is possible for people to increase and crops to mature. And in numerous Pawnee rituals, they refer to something called the Garden of Venus. And that garden is where all life originates. Direct quote, and so she, she maintained a garden from which sprang all streams of life. But here's the, here's the fascinating sentence. Even the sun renewed his fire nightly at her lodge. And a different quote from the bottom. For it is in this garden of Venus that the sun goes to renew his magic potency. The sun is rejuvenated in this garden. North America. And if you remember last year, I tried to show that the ancient Mesopotamian rite of the sacred marriage, the oldest ritual known on the planet Earth from about 3000 BC, describes the union of the king, uh, the purpose of which is to have a simulated sexual intercourse with the planet Venus. All scholars accept that, they just have no explanation for it. And 
a key part of the ceremony is the Garden of Venus in Anna. And in the, we have a, a text from about 2000 BC, a king left a, a summary of his sacred marriage hymn. And he describes the planet Venus coming down from heaven and him, him going in and having sex with her. Um, and he clearly describes the royal bed where this sexual act took place. And it's called G-I-R-I-N, Girin. So the leading scholar points out that Girin has perhaps a wider range of meaning than just bed. It means blossoming, fruitful, shining. But it also means Anana's luxuriant garden. And so uh, the Sumerian hymns talk about the king and they say, Long may he live upon the flowered throne. A clear reference to the same fourfold flower in the sky where creation took place. Virtually the final sentence in that sacred marriage hymn of that king from 2000 B.C. is talking about the planet Venus or Anana, and it says that she shines like the daylight on the great throne and makes the king position himself next to her like the sun. Again, I've never seen a discussion or an analysis of that sentence anywhere in the thousands of volumes of Sumerian literature, but it just hangs there and as an obvious pointer to the images we've been discussing. And curiously enough, in the, uh, recently the top scholar in um, Mesopotamian astral religion came out with a book where he prefaced it by saying, the skies above ancient Mesopotamia are our, are our skies, and the stars we see are theirs. That's how he begins the book. Nothing could be further from the truth. And as a result of those faulty premises, which dominate modern scholarship, it follows as sure as night follows day that most of their findings and most of their analyses are nothing but garbage and gobbledygook. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.